we interviewed somebody, we liked them a lot, and we were gonna make them an offer. Then a, a random recruiting company gave us a resume, th this person's resume. We hire the person. A month after the person starts working for us, we get a bill. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business Podcast, a project of the PTEX Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Coming to you from the PTEX headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. This is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome our guest, Nassano Muller. Nassano has extensive experience in operations and management consulting, specializing in driving business growth. At the Penguin Group, he led the establishment of a recruiting department to source top-tier talent, facilitating numerous successful placements, and significantly enhancing client performance. His current venture is Purple Stairs, an innovative recruiting platform. In our episode today, we delve into the world of recruiting and career enhancement. He shares insights into the challenges of job hunting, building a job marketplace platform, and the balance between attracting candidates and companies. Nassanel discusses the importance of systemizing onboarding processes, emphasizing the need for clear roles and contributions within a team. We also talk about the current job market, overpaying for talent, and the impact of automation and streamlining on the recruiting industry. This and so much more only on the Let's Talk Business podcast. Let's get right to our conversation with Nassanel Muller. Now I have a question to you. I know you have suggestions about different guests on the show. I want to hear from you. Email me directly at podcast at ptesgroup.com. And now to our conversation with Nassano Muller. Nassano, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So today we have a, I think it's a first, uh, we're going to be speaking about a topic that uh, I don't think maybe once or twice we we touched on, but we didn't dedicate a episode focusing on recruiting and career enhancement and so on and so forth. There's a product that you've been involved with. Uh, I know there's other partners as well that caught my eye. I saw, you know, from the marketing, obviously, great marketing around the product. And and I started looking into the product and understand what's the problem it's solving and so on and so forth. So and I figured uh, it's a great topic to have a conversation about. So for our listeners that don't know about you, tell us a little bit about your backstory, a little bit about um what you've been doing and what you can, and what got you to this space and ultimately um, about the product itself. Got it. Okay. So uh, we, we, we have been working on this now for um, almost two years. So there's a, there's a lot of backstory to what happened there. And, and uh, just to give a little bit of background before that on, on, on who I am and what I do and how I came into this to begin with. So I actually have originally went for a degree in social work. I'm a master in social work. I no longer have a license. I never actually practiced. Um, when I started off uh, working, I I was working for an agency and realized that there were a lot of operational things that I can get done there. Um, so I, I right away kind of shifted into operations. And in that role, I did a lot of uh, recruiting, interviewing tons of people every day. I got a knack for the people aspect of figuring out, you know, how the processes work and who's a good fit for doing whatever it is that needed to get done. So from there, I kind of basically fully transitioned into operations and the various roles that I had, I was involved in recruiting as well. In 2020, actually, during the, uh, during the pandemic, I met Maurice and we decided to start working together, Maurice Stein. And uh, we started working together. And at that point, he had a recruiting firm called Hawk Staffing. And uh, we had first started working together just on the uh, consulting side. I myself do uh, business processes and, and, uh, and software implementations for companies, off-the-shelf software. And, uh, and then we eventually brought everything under the umbrella of the Penguin Group. And we started doing recruiting uh, in the Penguin Group as well. We did that for a while. We had a lot of recruiters that were working for us. And there was a lot uh, that we learned along the way as we started, as we were doing the, the recruiting and, and as, you know, seeing the shift in the industry as time was going on was a very fascinating thing to watch because aside from the fact that it's cyclical, but because there were such interesting times to do recruiting through the pandemic, the, what was going on then and what happened in between and then what's happening now, there's just a lot of very interesting things that some some things have happened in the past, but some things, you know, it's just very, very interesting dynamics, which we'll get into soon. 
Um, but that's basically my, my backstory and how I got into recruiting to begin with. Got it. So, so let's talk about recruiting because, um, once upon a time, somebody was looking for an employee. They would put some ads, they would put uh, print ads and then eventually, um, digital ads and they would have the interviewing process. I think, um, recruiting agencies were around for a long time. I could say years ago, we still, we already used recruiting agencies. Let's say when we needed a specialty skill, such as a senior graphic designer or anybody in that space. Instead of just putting an ad and getting all kinds of resumes, we would give it to a recruiter to go out and headhunt us, somebody. And usually they were very successful in finding people, let's say for us, they were trying to do it on their own freelance and they were trying to get clients on their own and convincing them maybe, you know, it, there is a place to join an agency. And we were pretty successful in finding great talent. I guess when, when COVID hit, um, I think what, what, what I saw in the market is a huge, influx of people looking for additional employees and where people were fighting for the same employees and what ended up happening is a ton of recruiting came into the space and a lot of a lot of recruiters were fighting for the same resumes <laughs> so what have you seen from that space that was like a stepping stone of this is not working there needs to be a better way so the interesting thing is that you were saying as far as you know niche jobs that people were looking for with recruiters, those actually tend to have more success because you're, you, the, the, the companies know exactly what they're looking for. And you know, aside from what you're looking for, you know who you're looking for, right? So that makes the, the search much, much easier, much more targeted. And it's, it's much easier to communicate back and forth between, you know, in that company and recruiter relationship. What had definitely happened during during the pandemic is that people were just hiring and hiring. There was an influx of cash and people were hiring and, and actually overpaying because they needed to get people that didn't exist because there were a lot of people that weren't working while the people that were working, there, there was just a shortage of people that 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 were going to fill the jobs that companies were just growing and growing and needed to fill these these positions. So what happened what happened since then is that the reality has kind of set in. So first of all, aside from the fact that we're we're in recession now, where there's a lot of, um, it's an interesting re recession because it's not like you can pinpoint one particular industry, but there's definitely people feeling it. Definitely a tightness, a tightness in the in, in a bunch of the different sectors of business. Correct, but it's affecting everything. But uh, but before we even got there, I think that reality set in a little bit to the sense where people started realizing that they're that the people that they're paying are not providing the value of what they're paying for. And I think also there's been such a tremendous shift into going into automating and streamlining things that, that people also realize, like, I don't have to pay someone this amount of money in order to get these things done. I can automate that. So then when you put that together with the recession where people have to cut budgets, you put that in together with actually right now, which, which is very interesting because people are, you know, it's the end of the season, right? So people are coming uh, after the school year. There's, there's going to be a lot of entry-level candidates coming in. So in previous years, entry level candidates were demanding, you know, $30 an hour, you know, whatever it was that they felt they can come in and just make, you know, right off the bat because, oh, what do you mean? That's what the market is. Um, the reality is, is that they're getting offers that people were getting five years ago and they're going to have to take them because that's what's available. And the, what I think is going to happen here is that companies are going to start hiring some of those people and letting go some of the people that are overpaid even more than they've been letting go already. So that way they can catch up on, on, on the, their budgets and the people who, who have been getting those high salaries for now for technically no reason really are going to, are going to face with a harsh reality because they're going to go into the market and say, well, I was making this, I should be making the same or more, but the reality is they're overpaid and they're going to, they're going to see as much as like a 30% decrease in, in what they were making. So that's just a little bit of the dynamic and what the shift has been in, in, the, in the market. Now, when you take that into account, people are trying to save money. So recruiting is a very, very expensive service to pay for, right? Um, sure. You know, depending on who you're using for it, um, you know, between 15 and 25 percent of, the, of the, the first year salary or whether it's a lower level position and people are charging a flat rate of five thousand dollars or some, whatever it may be. It's a very expensive proposition. Aside from that, there's a lot of open positions, and these are the hardest positions to fill. that are just very general. I need someone to come and do something good for my company. A lot of companies don't have job descriptions. They don't really know exactly what they're looking for, or they're looking for somebody who's just anybody. 
So when you're looking for that, well, what, who, who do I find for such a role and who, who's going to want to come to me for such a role like that? And that's where you really need to be a recruiter to, to find the right person and get a sense of what the, what the right fit is from both sides. And that's where um, a lot of the recruiters who came into play over the pandemic where they didn't have to necessarily do all of that. And now they do. Now all of a sudden it's changing. Well, how, how, do you, how do I do this type of recruiting? So that's one aspect of, of why recruiting has, has gotten more difficult. On top of that, there's, there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of different things happening within the recruiting industry in, in, in our, in our market that has affected how people view recruiters and how people deal with recruiters. So there's been instances of, uh, lack of clarity, communication, just people throwing resumes. Um, that's been a complaint, uh, you know, that I've heard a lot. There's also been some complaints of dishonesty because in, in some aspects, like, you know, someone, someone's interviewing somebody and sometimes they're playing both sides of the coin. So they're telling the candidate they want this so that the candidate agrees. And then the time the company, the candidate wants that. So it actually happened to me once when I was working with a recruiter and they promised the company some, whatever what they wanted to hear. And they promised me what I wanted to hear so that we both said, yes, they got their fee. And, and I got into a position that, that I probably should not have gotten into, but that so but that that's something that happens. Uh, other things are also affecting how companies you're recruiting because I'll give you a story that actually happened to to us, and it was very interesting to hear this and see it firsthand as somebody who was still doing recruiting at the time. And the payment group has shut down the recruiting department as of now, but this was back when we were still doing recruiting. We were hiring for for a, a position, and we just put out feelers out there, you know, looking for somebody to fill a role, and uh, and we started getting resumes from different people, and we interviewed somebody, we liked them a lot, and we were going to make them an offer. Then a, a random recruiting company gave us a resume, th- this person's resume, and we weren't in contract with them. They were not our recruiting company. Like there was no agreement in place. We had already interviewed the person. They sent us the resume. We didn't think anything of it, whatever it is. We hire the person. A month after the person starts working for us, we get a bill for tens of thousands of dollars. And, uh, you know, you have to pay this bill. And I, I don't even know who you are. Like, I never even spoke to you. I never had a kind of conversation with you. I never signed an agreement with you. And I'm getting a bill. So I, that was a very, very, um, you know, big awakening for me into what other people are seeing, right? Because... As a recruiter coming dealing with companies and they're, they're they're treating me a certain way because I was doing recruiting, I was wondering like where's this coming from? And then I'm thinking to myself, if this is what they're experiencing, I, I, I hear it. I hear where they're coming from. It's a, it's a it was a very big awakening for me. So tell us more about uh, Purple Steer. So um, obviously, um, what we want to discuss today is the platform that uh, you've been building with other partners. So what problem is Purple Steers solving? What is par- Purple Steers? What is the product? What is the offering? And then what problem is it solving? Okay, so Purple Steers is a, a website where we solve point, pain points from the recruiting industry that we saw on both sides, both from the recruiting perspective and from the company's perspective when they're dealing with recruiters as well as from the candidate's perspective. So starting from the candidate's perspective, first of all, what it is is that uh, somebody can go on the website and they can, uh, they can upload their resume and then it helps them fill in a profile um, automatically based on what's in their resume. It fills in a profile for them and creates a, a profile that companies are then going to be able to see uh, their information. Now, first of all, just a backstory on, the, on, on that in itself. When you're developing software, it's very hard to know in the beginning exactly, you know, what you're designing and what you're developing, what, what, how much development is going to be involved, what it's going to cost. And just to highlight that, so we originally, when we were starting to build the software, we said, you know, really when people are going to come to the website, the first people that are going to come are going to be candidates and they're going to have to fill in a lot of information. We should make it as easy as possible. Let's build a resume parser. Right, like Indeed has, or you know, these other companies, you drop in the resume, it fills everything in, and we decide, you know, what it's going to be too complicated to develop. We're going to skip it for now. We'll revisit it later. We fast forward to when we actually are about to launch, and we're like, we really need to do something about this. We can't launch without a resume parser, and 
when we started, ChatGPT didn't exist. And once it did, we're like, wait, instead of building a parser, why don't we integrate a G a ChatGPT into the website and let it do the parsing for us and see how that works? So what technically would have been six to nine months of development and tons of money took five days and it was done. Oh, wow. So just a, a little bit of background there. So now people come to the website, they can upload the resume and it, it parses everything for them. They can review it. And then the key here is they get to go next to every piece of information and they get to choose whether or not companies that are looking at their profiles on the website actually get to see that information. So if there's something they feel is too identifying or, or you know, will give away who they are, then they, then they can choose to make that private. Now, if, if somebody comes to the website and they want to, um, and they don't care about being private because, because most of the time people who are looking to be private are people that, um, is sometimes higher level or people currently in positions that don't want their, their employer to know that they're looking so they can have a completely open profile. It's up to them, but, but basically, um, it's up to the candidates to choose what, what they show. Once they have a profile, uh, whatever they chose to show is going to go up on the website and then the employers get to see and search for these candidates. So on the employer side, companies have to uh, create a profile. They also have to fill in information. It's not just the candidates that have to fill in information. The reason is, is because we want the, the candidates to know who they're talking to. We want them to know who's requesting their information. So a company will, will fill in information and then request, to, we request access to an account. And then we have to look into them and then approve the account. So we make sure that they're a legit company and that we know who they are. Once they get approved, then they can start searching on the website for um, for different candidates. And we have different filters that they can set up to see what they're looking for. When they see someone that's a potential fit, they click request on mask. And then the candidate gets an email saying a company's interested in you. The candidate can then see the company's profile and then either allow or deny the request for their information. If they, if they deny it, they disappear from the company's search. If they approve it, the company gets their contact information. So that's the process and what it is. And just one thing I just want to uh, mention. So the, the company's process, the, the, one of the pain points of companies is, is, is that search. is going to be that search of figuring out what they're looking for. So what we're actually releasing very soon, um, it's in beta right now, so it's going to be released very soon, is companies will actually be able to click uh, and insert a job description. And if they don't have one, they can say, help me create one. The website will ask them a few questions and generate a job description for them. Based off of that, it will automatically set the filters for them. And then on top of that, once they click search, they can adjust it before they click search. They, once they click search, the website will actually suggest and rate, will rate the candidates and how well the candidate fits the job description that they gave it. So you don't have to do that, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to help people find the people that are the right fit for their specific job. So, so let me ask you some follow-up questions, just again, and and because I don't know a lot about the pro, uh, the, the 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 platform, so forgive me for asking those questions. But let's say if somebody doesn't want to go with the traditional way of of a recruiter, like what is the key benefits of your platform versus uh, any job site? Uh, you know, there's job site uh, websites out there now that will have looking for this position, looking for that position, or employees. From both sides of the yes, there are websites even within the community, but even if you go out of the community, there's there you mentioned before indeed or others like what what sets this apart as far as is it geared towards um the specific Jewish community or is it open platform for um for for like what what would you say sets it apart to say you know nothing like this existed that we needed this platform so uh, right now it is it is uh targeting the from community um, and there was nothing in the from community where it's strictly candidates and it's a database of candidates for companies to go and access. You're searching for a new, for, for somebody for a new role, you go back on there and look again and you look through the candidates and there's new candidates constantly coming on every single day. We didn't launch for companies until we had that going, until we had enough candidates constantly coming in. Now, from, from, you know, uh, there, the answer to that question is there's a little bit from the candidate side and a little bit to the, from the employer side on what's different and what the need was and what role it's filling. From the candidate side, it, it was very difficult for people, especially now there's so many candidates. There are so many candidates out there. 
before we had the pain group had shut down the recruiting department and we launched Purple Stairs, we were getting you know, sometimes 60 candidates a day. And what do you do with that? All right? like the, 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 it's, we can't possibly interview that many people every single day and really, really get to know them. You're not getting back to them. So there are people that are, that are submitting their, their resumes and they're not hearing anything. And they're actually very hurt. Like I've heard it from, from candidates, they're very hurt. Like they, they're finally looking for a job. They're reaching out to recruiters. And because they're not maybe on the lower level of, of expertise, and nobody's even responding to them. Correct. And, 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 and then I don't blame recruiters for it because it's really, it's not physically possible. It's, it's just not. And so then from the candidate's perspective is that you're, you're stuck in the, in the hands of the recruiter because you can't get your resume in front of, in front of companies unless the recruiter happens to put your resume forward because they, they thought of you. So we completely take that out of the picture because now candidates can get their resumes directly in front of companies without needing to hope that someone else is putting it in front of them. Now, in order to get your resume in front of somebody in the past, either had to go through a recruiter like we were just describing or find the company's job board and start su submitting your resume to a specific job. Now, that is you know, uh, something that potentially people can still do. That's not that, you know, Purple Stairs is not taking the place of that. But it's not the regular job boards. The problem with that companies had from that perspective is that in order for people to know about them, they have to do their own advertising. Whereas here we're doing advertising and we're drawing new candidates every day. And then companies have a pool of candidates to pick from instead of needing to constantly advertise every time they have a role. This also means that as candidates are coming in, even when you're not advertising, you're still getting new candidates coming in. And then when you're ready to look for a new role, the candidates are already there. You don't have to like start advertising and start, start fielding resumes. Uh, going back to the candidate side, there are a lot of people that were in, that were in jobs and unfortunately they, they feel stuck. They feel like uh, I'm at a dead end. I'm not making, I'm not making ends meet. Um, so how do I get there? That's a lot. A lot of people have this question because they're, they really can't afford their, their living month to month at best. And, they can't afford it. So like, what's the end game over here? I'm mean, this is the way I'm going to live the rest of my life or will I actually at some point get a job that's going to pay me enough to pay my bills? Because what's the point of working if, if I'm going to just be in debt anyway? So there's a lot of that going on where people are feeling that and they want to see what am I getting my value or is there a way I can increase my value or is there someone out there that's actually, am I getting under underpaid and is there someone willing to actually pay me what I'm worth? So that allows people who are currently in a position where they're, where for the most part, if a, if a company finds out somebody's looking for a job, they let them go. So this allows people to put feelers out there and see if, if there's even something to think about and then to know uh, where they stand. And that's a very important thing. A lot of people, even, even if they're okay and they're happy technically in their job, they don't know where they stand and they're constantly unhappy themselves because they don't know, am I getting underpaid? Am I undervalued? Or am I valued correctly, and am I getting paid what I'm supposed to be getting paid? So that that's a very important thing. Got it. So so let's be, let's let me dive deeper on this conversation because I think this this uh, the point that you just mentioned is a very important point, um, and I think I, I want to address it from both 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 sides of the coin. Um, one is some people feel they're underpaid basically because they maybe spoke to someone locally and they they probably lied of how much they're making. <laughs> they say, wait a minute, you're making this amount of money and why am I at this job so long and I'm not making that money? That's one part. And the other part is what we've seen, as you mentioned before, when COVID hit, there was a, a desperate need for hiring and people were overpaying, significantly overpaying. You know, uh, at PTEX, we had a couple of people that were, uh, you know, um, offered significantly on a, a lot more money that they used to make over here. And I'm still friends with them. I said, you know what, take it. If somebody is offering you that, that much more money, like I'm not holding you hostage over here and you got to do what's best for you and your family. But some of them are not uh, lost their job since, and they're now back to the work, job force and looking for a job and so on and so forth. So I guess my question to you is, A, what are you doing on, 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 on the platform, but even just from your experience being a recruiter yourself, what are you telling this guy that calls you up and says, you know what, I'm making X amount of dollars. This is my job. I've been with the company for X amount of years. Is this the maximum I could get? In the past, recruiters were constantly saying, you could probably get more you could probably, because they needed the good resumes. They needed those good candidates in the market. They can say, you know what, I could get you for sure another 20, 30% of what you're doing now or 
to get your hybrid, uh, you know, setup versus being in the, you know, in the office every day. Like, what can you share on that to, for people to know what's realistic and what's not realistic? So I think the most important thing is to be honest, because the people are notoriously bad at, at evaluating themselves. Everybody's very good at evaluating others and seeing how others are. But when it comes to yourself, there, there are blinders on and it's natural. So it's very important for people to, to really hear from somebody of what, where, they, where they actually stand. So telling somebody that you could get them increased value, it, it's, a, it's a very, very bad thing to say to them because it really can hurt, hurt people very, very badly. Because the second someone hears that, they're unhappy where they are, where they were technically happy until now. And then, and then they're going to go and work miserable every day to a point where they're going to fail at their job because they're miserable. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where then they get let go because they're no longer performing. So I've seen this happen time and time again. So it's very important to really be realistic and, and true with people to tell them, this is what you're worth. This is what you could potentially get on the market. And then to actually, if they get more than that, great. But, but don't overshoot them because that, then, then you're, you're just ruining their, they're going to be upset. They're not going to be happy when, when the reality sets in. Uh, but it's definitely a very difficult situation. And I think that just being sympathetic to some of these people who are, who are going through this right now, because somebody who got a job coming, coming out of the, uh, you know, coming out of seminary or coming out of college or high school, um, you know, five years ago, four or five years ago, and to get a certain salary and then now for reality to set in where they're going to, where they can get so much less and that's what they're going to be stuck with. It's a very hard thing to swallow because even though technically you can explain it uh, from a, from a technical standpoint that yes, things are worth less now we're in a recession, but people don't think that way. People think I'm worth less now. Right. And that's, that's what's difficult for people, to, for people to hear. So when people have the opportunity to get themselves in front of, in front of any company that is, that is looking for, for, for candidates, you're not, I think the, the thing that, that's very difficult is for people to have to constantly follow up with somebody, you know, did you send my resume to anyone? Are any companies looking at it? Whereas instead you're in control of your resume and then you know that it's up there and you're doing everything that you need to be in front of, in front of companies. And that, that takes away that need of feeling, you know, that, that I'm being ignored. It does it solve the, the aspect of that if you don't hear from employers that maybe you feel like maybe there's something wrong with my resume or something wrong with my experience? No, I don't think that we can solve that right now. But but it does take a lot of that pressure off. One of the things when whenever somebody builds a marketplace, well, let's even think, uh, go back to the times when Uber launched. In order to be successful, they needed to have riders, but they also need to have drivers. If the if the if the ratio is off, then obviously every company has their ratio. At the end of the day, it's not effective. How are you working towards that to make sure that the balance between businesses, employers, and employees and resumes, uh, the ratio is there in order to make sure that there's enough of a big pool that these candidate that it's worth um, using the platform. Right. So, I'll tell you what we did. Whether or not we did was perfect is, uh, is, is uh, up for debate and, and opinion, but this is what we did and what our thought process was. So this is very much the kind of a situation of the chicken or the egg, right? Like exactly you're, you're saying with, with Uber, you've got to have both right away. So what we did was we first, we first um, advertised and marketed to, towards candidates. The reason being is that it's free for candidates, so there's really nothing for them to lose. So you go, you create your profile there, you set it, you forget it, and that's it. It's not. And in doing that, we got we got hundreds of candidates to sign up for the, for the website and create profiles on the website. Once we had a few hundred candidates on the website, at that point, we started marketing to companies who are always constantly looking. And for the price that we're charging for a company of $300 a month, that you can spend more than that on just one classified today. So to pay that amount and you have access to hundreds of candidates instantly, it became worth their while at that point to sign up. So now at this point we have we have quite a few uh, paying paying companies that are that are constantly searching the website and the way it works is anytime there's new candidates they get they get notified right away so they know to go on the website to look at the new candidates and this way we kind of had a little bit of both and at this point we have over thirteen hundred probably close to fourteen hundred re uh, resumes at this point so there's a lot to look through no matter wh what the company is there's a lot of candidates to look through and uh, and as we grow. It, the value is just gonna just gonna be uh, more and more. But the people who are really gonna find value, the companies that are gonna really find value, are companies that are constantly hiring, 
Because if you're constantly hiring, instead of needing to put out a, a classified every other day, you pay one flat fee, you have access to candidates. Companies that are looking to hire once a year and they're looking for something very niche, it's not necessarily the right fit for them unless they want to just have access to the pool of candidates for a month, you know, something like that. But what are you doing in order to make sure, um, um, to make sure, let's say, that the information stays relevant? Let's say if a candidate found a new job, they're taking all of their prof, they're taking all of their resumes and stuff like that. So we do have a, a feature for putting a, a, a profile to sleep. So if a candidate, if somebody finds a job, they can go on and, and they can put their, their profile to sleep. They can also delete their profile if they want to. And then we are in touch with our employers to find out whether or not they, they have found hires on the website and, if, and, and how things are going. Um, and if people are inactive for a certain period of time for both sides, from the employers and from the candidates, we follow up to, to make sure that they're still relevant. And if not, to put their, their accounts to sleep. Is there any um, you know, piece of the technology take you after the initial introduction between the two um, parties, like on the actual negotiation or... Uh, swapping information, or is it just j- basically just to identify those candidates? That's where it ends. Correct. That, right now, that's where it ends. There could be down the road in integrations with with the software programs that people are using for their HR, or payroll, and things like that to bring the candidates' information in. But right now, that's where it ends. Got it. I want to speak uh, the the last few minutes about obviously. Um, you're building technically a new company. You may have your recruiting background and I've spoken to the other partners as well. There's money investing, you know, investment that goes into a technology business. What would you say is the, you know, the surprising factors uh, that came upon in the journey of building a, a software SaaS business? The interesting thing is, is that we, you know, we do have, uh, you know, investors in, involved. Um, but the, the people that we had involved in the partners in the project are people who do software and know software for a living. And what we did was we first planned out what the process would look like and everything that we wanted the, the, the website to have. Then we took that and we translated that into an actual design. And then from there, translated that into, into development. The only thing that really... Well, which always, I think in every software project turns out that way is that the development takes longer than what you initially expect it to. But I think that anybody doing this kind of project, you have to figure that that's going to happen. But the, the key thing with this is to really figure out your process first. Once you figure out your process on what the website or software is going to do, what buttons is it going to have? Like literally everything. You got to think, think it through, pretend like you're actually clicking through the software and try to think of all the different things that are going to happen. And then the base your design off of that. Once you do that, then getting feedback from external people and, and really f- trying to figure out, did you miss anything? When they look at the website, do they look at it differently than the way you thought that they would look at it? And doing that kind of research before you actually start development. So that way you, you end up, when you start the development, you're not redoing things uh, uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of times over as you're developing. But that's, that, I think, is the most important thing. How do you how do you go about uh, different partners in this business and delegating the different responsibilities, making sure that that you don't over overlap on 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 skills and responsibilities? It's a good question. So, in our case, it was very easy because um, we have we have someone who does software, and we have somebody who does marketing. We have somebody who does um, uh, operations. So we each contributed our specific thing, and we all know exactly where our lines are because. That's what we brought to the table, and that's why we're involved in the project. I think it's very important for whoever is involved to really know coming in what their role is and why it's their role and what the value is that they're bringing to the table and then to stick with it because ultimately ultimately, that's what's going to get things forward the fastest, whereas otherwise you can just keep spinning in circles. But I think that worked out very, very nicely. Mm-hmm. Outside of your recruiting experience, um how much did your experience in systems processes and automation and everything that that you do on that side help you with your role in Purple Stairs? It absolutely helped because I, because I help businesses develop processes, so I was very familiar with the process of understanding what a workflow would look like and how it would actually present itself and and how to how to design it but in a way that translates into software so that way we're like oh we can probably leverage that that kind of feature or create that and and do this and knowing where software is going and where where things are headed to come up with with the, the new features that we're going to be releasing as well so it definitely it definitely helped 
I think the next the next step we touched about it before is that what I see and uh, what I hear from business owners and from new employees in different companies that there's a long way to go on the small business side of developing systems and processes for onboarding a new a new employee to the team. I'll give you an example. We have a whole system internally that we use for our own team uh, for onboarding. Um, and, and one of the examples I use is at one day I sent out an email to my whole team a couple of years ago and I said, what is the three or four things that you that took you a few weeks to find out in the company once you, and you joined? And believe it or not, the weirdest things come up, but it's still important. Like if my phone doesn't work, who am I going to? If there's no forks in the kitchen, do I do I do a report it to someone who's in charge of, of you know, of uh, if I want a PTO, I have my direct report, but or I, I, it goes to HR, you know, stuff like that. So now we have a system outside of obviously core values and getting them acquainted with the culture and everything else. Like a few days in, you'll get an email, like it's called like like odds and ends or so something like that. And here's a bunch of things that might be helpful to know. So it's not like a formatted thing, but it's very helpful. You know, I remember once somebody told me that there was basically a couple of weeks passed or something and the, the wife, his wife didn't get a paycheck. It was the first paycheck. And he met the, the, her, the owner of that company in, in, in the street. And he says, is everything working out? And he says, yeah, everything's working out. Are you sure? He says, of course, everything. She's pretty good for the few, first few weeks. Why didn't she get a paycheck? So, oh, I forgot to tell her it's every second week. And she started like just, the, just about, when, so, so she didn't have yet a full cycle for payroll. Nobody just, they took it for granted. It's every second week. But guess what? You hired no person. You didn't give them the basic information, like how payroll said. So a lot of that could be today automated, could be put into practice, but it's so important. You know, it's so important. So I, I definitely encourage you to to build out some of those training or some of those basic information that, that the employer needs to say, what's our training process? How long is the onboarding process? Whatever it is. And that's just going to force the, the, you know, the employers to be a little bit more systemi- systemized when it comes to the information they need to share with the candidate. Right. And I think it's, it's only a matter of time before people realize how much money it saves them. Because like, even in the story that you just mentioned, that employee went about the first two weeks and their experience in the first two weeks as this employer had, had, was a negative experience instead of a positive one. And it could have just as easily been positive. Yeah, I'll share with you even more, even more than that. Like I'll leave you a, r- a real life story at PTEX. Um, once upon a time, we, we, you know, all of a sudden the candidate arrives and we need a computer the day before we remind ourselves we needed a computer. And now we're paying overnight shipping. Yeah. Versus, uh, in our, in, in our new process, like not new. It's, it's a couple of years now, but as soon as somebody gets hired, an email will go out to IT to have a conversation with a direct report to see what technology, what, what they need in order to, to be set up properly. What does it take? It's set up once. And, and we're not taking away the human element. Yeah, those two people have to uh, talk to each other, but nobody has to now remember to speak to it. Like there's an email in your inbox saying that talk to each other two weeks before that person, you know, most people when they get hired, there's usually a week or two or whatever, like till they get started. But, of course, you save so much money if you're organized, and it's the first impression for the employee. How many times uh, you would speak to a candidate and they'll say, you know, I showed up in the hallway, I didn't know, and then all of a sudden I'm waiting four hours because the person that hired me didn't show up. And I, I you know, it's, it's a very awkward feeling as well. So you give them, you know, if I'm not in the office, you're gonna be meeting X, Y, Z, this person will meet with you first, second, and so much of that could be, it doesn't have to be down to the, to the T and to the minute. So you don't have to be that, that, uh, that uh, systemized, but just the basics. Right. So when th- I think the, the, the thing that, that, that people, the pushback I get the most with that is, is, is I'm taking away the human element, like you just said. And I think that people don't realize is that you're not taking away the human element. The, there's no human element involved in your candidate coming in and needing to fill out their name in 20 different places the first time coming into the office. Hundred percent. The example I use is that we have a system in place where we take the the employee's birthday anniversary date um, once they start, and then I get an automatic email um, from that the day of. Okay, and the same was with the anniversary. Not because I want to automate the process and take away the human element to remind me to go over to say um, happy anniversary. It's five years you've been with the company. It's three years you've been with the company. So you're using automation and processes to support the human element, not to take to uh, to take away the human element. I think that's the confusion that a lot of people have. Correct. 
Very cool, very cool. So I, I guess it's a it's a new platform. When did it launch? So we launched uh, for candidates in the end of December. Oh, cool. So it's, it's been a half a year now. Yes. Uh, so how could people find out more about it? What's the URL? So the URL is purplestairs.com. And uh, both both for, for candidates and employers, they can both create accounts by just going to that, that website. Got it. For the link resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes at www.ptexgroup.com slash podcast. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Number one, a book that changed your life. Uh, Profit First. Great book. Number two, and by the way, for our listeners, Profit First is by Mike Michalowicz. We had him on the show. Go back and listen to the episode. We have a guy that told me a couple of months ago that he saved 50 something thousand dollars by following Profit First, a person that never saved a dollar in his life. So go back and read that. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you never forget. Um, to, to take a step back before making decisions and slow down before making decisions. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently? Maybe maybe going for a different degree in, in school. I mean, I do use my social work degree in doing what I do, but uh, but uh, after completely transitioning away and not using it at all, you know, maybe doing something else. <laughs> Last and final question, what's still on your bucket list to achieve? To grow the companies that we're, you know, that I'm working, I'm working on and to, to see them become successful. Nice. Nassano, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. Same here. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Now, that's my conversation with Nassano Muller. My takeaway from this one, number one, focus on honesty and realistic evaluation when advising individuals on the potential for increased value in their job market, promoting trust and credibility within the recruiting industry. Number two, Implement systemizing onboarding processes to ensure a positive employee experience and facilitate a smooth transition for new hires, ultimately contributing to higher employee retention. Number three, maintain a balance between automation and personalized interaction and recruiting processes to efficiently handle a large volume of candidates while preserving the human element in the hiring process. Number four, take a step back and carefully assess decisions before making them to minimize potential setbacks and assure strategic, well-informed choices when building and expanding companies. And last, and number five, learn from successful business principles such as those found in Profit First by Mike Michalowicz to optimize financial strategies and saving within a growing business venture. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guests shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends. And if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Look Business podcast is a P-Tex Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day.